Okay, this morning, we are continuing breaking down Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, found in the Gospel of Matthew. It's what we are calling the blueprint for building God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And we've got a lot of ground to carry or cover this morning, and you're going to see our first scripture popping up already. We're, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. We do have a lot of verses, so you can reference the screen, or if you have a physical Bible in your row, I'd, I'd encourage you can to build that out as well. But here we go. These are going to be a lot of Jesus' words today in Matthew chapter 5. He begins with this. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says here that he came to fulfill the law. He came to fill it up, to complete it, to accomplish it, to perform it, and what we might call to live it out. And how exactly does he do that? Well, he does it by moving the idea of righteousness from the observable place of outward behaviors to the hidden spaces of the heart. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is not bringing a, a brand new or a new set of laws. And he's not replacing the commands that God gave the Israelites in the Torah, okay, in those first five books specifically. Instead, Jesus is outlining the relationships and the way of living that fulfill what I call the deepest intention of God's commands. And what will be, become clear here as we continue on is that Jesus is more interested in an inside-out goodness rather than merely doing the right thing. Jesus adds what I kind of like to, to coin the term is transformational extensions. He adds that to each command. And it's this familiar language that we'll get to here in just moments where he says things like, you have heard it said, but I tell you. We're going to jump in and continue on here with these transformational extensions. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Whew. We got through one of the bigger heavy sections right there. We're going to keep picking our way through, but I want to kind of lay out each situation. So this situation Jesus is teaching on is about being angry with someone. Anybody been angry with anyone this week? You, you can own that if you want to. Uh, you can just maybe nod your head. I, I would assume in this room, and I really respect you all, but 
but we've probably been a little angry with someone this week. I think that's just kind of a normal thing. And so the situation's that, being angry with someone. And Jesus references the commandment in Exodus 20, which is part of the big Decalogue, the top ten list, if you're a Letterman fan from back in the day. It's the big ten, the Ten Commandments. He references that out of Exodus 20, that you shall not murder. In Jesus' extension, then, it goes beyond physical murder to the root issue of anger and contempt. It's anger and insults and unresolved conflict that are matters of the heart. And if they go unchecked, they lead to spiritual, it could even be physical, but spiritual death. Even more, we are being told that we should live in a way that that doesn't stir up anger in others. I know some drivers that could really uh, use that advice, right? Are you with me? That was a little but but anyway. But that we're being told we should not live in a way that stirs up anger in others. So, so if you learn that you have done something that has offended others, we're being told to go to them and to make it right. It's even important enough to leave in the middle of worship to take care of it. And I wonder that if we took Jesus very seriously on this, would there really be any of us gathered in a church on a Sunday morning? We could all get up and leave right now probably, right? It's fair. See, Jesus is calling us to deal with anger and hatred because it leads to division and dissension and ultimately could lead to murder. But let's not, let's make sure to make note that Jesus is not saying that we should go around confronting others about the way they have offended us. If we did that, and maybe you've experienced that, uh, the results would be harmful. Those kind of things are destructive. Rather, what Jesus is saying here in this bit of text is that if you remember that something you have done has offended someone else, go to them and make it right. This is about confession, It's about reconciliation for your offenses. This is not about someone else's offenses. Important distinction. Jesus continues on. He says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, Gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So the situation here is a desire to have someone other than your spouse. And the commandment that Jesus brings up is another one of the top ten. It's you shall not commit adultery, found in Exodus 20. And so for Jesus' extension, you know, this, the, he, he points to the fact that this begins long before the act of adultery. It starts in the heart. It starts in the mind with lustful thoughts. You see, the issue is not just what we do, but it's, but it's the desires that we build up, and it's what we think. And here Jesus is calling us to what I would just call a radical purity. After all, spiritual integrity, it really does start in our minds. But there's this crazy whole part there, right, in this teaching, right, this little section about all this gouging out eyes and hacking off our limbs. I mean, isn't Jesus telling us that the problem was with our heart and our mind, not the actions? So why would he advocate cutting off body parts that cause immoral behaviors? It seems here that Jesus is once again exposing the limitations of law-based righteousness. 
In other words, this is a clear reminder that if we do not deal with our head and heart issues, we have to go around and seriously maim ourselves in order to keep from sinning. Personally, I'd rather do some of this head and heart work than hack off hands and gouge out eyes. Because at some point, it wouldn't take us very long, right, to be the Monty Python soldier with just a a bloody torso on the ground. Okay? That's where that leads. And it wouldn't even take us long. I could probably accomplish that today. Jesus continues on another transformational extension. He says, It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now the situation, you can back up, Henry. That's the next one. Thanks. Maybe I didn't move that one out of there. Sorry, dude. Sorry, screwing things up. But the situation here is is all about disposing of your marriage partner. It's about disposing of your marriage partner. And the commandment that Jesus references is that a man could divorce his wife by giving her a certificate of divorce. Okay, this is back in Deuteronomy chapter 24. And so Jesus' extension now, it raises the bar on any type of a casual attitude we might have toward divorce. Stating that divorce, except for sexual immorality, leads to adultery. His emphasis here is on the sacredness of marriage and the heart of commitment. Jesus invites us to honor marriage as a lifelong covenant, not to be treated lightly. It's helping us to see that God's design has always been for faithfulness and endurance. Now, Jesus was addressing the culture of his day. And so I want to I make sure, this, these are always tense topics, right? Nothing like Jesus to just jump in the deep end on us on all these big topics. But, but Jesus was addressing the culture of his day. One that was even more so prone to being abusive toward women. And divorce was then especially damaging to women because women that were divorced were often then reduced to things like begging, and prostitution. You see, I think it's important for us because of that in our thought here is that we have to avoid then extrapolating this extension into our time and then somehow forcing or requiring anyone or everyone to stay in a loveless or abusive marriage. And it's unfortunate that I've seen that play out in churches before. That's not what we should do with this. But let's hold intention with that thought that Jesus does address this issue immediately after talking about anger and lust. And I just wonder that how many divorces maybe could be prevented if husbands and wives would deal with those issues first. As Henry already got there, nice job, dude. Right here, we pick it back up. Jesus continues on. He says again, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Boy, no doubt. Isn't that one sad? All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So the situation that Jesus is getting at here, this one always seems a little peculiar to me, but it's it's wanting someone to trust you or to believe you. And Jesus brings up the commandment that's found in Leviticus 19 about do not break your oaths and then jesus takes it further his extension calls for such a life of integrity that oaths just become unnecessary he says your yes should be yes your no should be 
No. As followers of Jesus, our word should just be enough. We are called to live in such honesty and integrity that people trust us without needing something extra to substantiate that. But Jesus then does list some some things that were commonly used for oaths back in his day. And here he seems to be pointing out that that this kind of oath idea, this oath-taking, is is actually self-serving or self-centered. It's essentially a form of verbal manipulation. People embellish a statement with an oath in order to impress others with their honesty. It may be to increase their status in others' eyes, or it may be a ploy to get something they want. Either way, Jesus is reminding all of us that there is no room for that. There's no need for that in his community of people. He continues on. We've got a couple more here to to get through. He says this. He says, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. The situation here is about being injured or being taken advantage of by another person. And the commandment that Jesus brings up is out of Exodus 21, and it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I want to give us just a little quick side note here that, that when this law came about back there in Exodus, this was actually a huge step forward in the practice of the ancient world. That's because the, this Jewish law was an attempt to actually limit the escalation of violence. You are only allowed to retaliate in the same degree as the wrong. That's actually a significant step in the right direction. But Jesus' extension tells us that rather than seeking revenge, Jesus calls us to a posture of non-retaliation and actually then a practice of radical generosity. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other also. He tells us, go the extra mile. I mean, we are being ordered to resist the natural tendency that we have for retaliation. In fact, he is saying to try and to even help the one who has wronged you. This turns the world's value system on its head. And ultimately does reflect the generosity of God's love. But I like to try to be honest and right up front with you. For me, this is where Jesus' extensions get really tough. Because each of us has had these kinds of things happen to us. I mean, we might be able to skip over the murder part. I think I'm at least, at least in that big grand action, adultery, divorce, maybe the swearing oath section, it's, it's interesting. But we have all been taken advantage of, right? Maybe even just this past week, something that's still sticking with you. Oh. But remember, Jesus isn't talking about, you know, the questions he's asking are, are did I do the specific action that he's talking about? Rather, what Jesus is pointing towards is, is am I becoming the kind of person that Jesus' illustrations are picturing. And so let's pause and ask a question here, and and I think this is important in this section, this eye-for-eye section, is how often does equal retaliation actually work? If you have a sibling, you know that equal retaliation does not work, correct? Correct? I see parents smiling. Maybe you're thinking about your childhood, but you're certainly thinking about your little people in your house. 
How about something for all of us here in our today context? What about this Palestinian and Israeli conflict? And even this morning, there's more bombing. These are two groups of people who are, at least I'm going to presume, they're trying to live out the old system of righteousness. And I'm pretty darn sure that the conflict will never end until someone says, we will not retaliate, period. To see that, that would be a fresh kind of good, a fresh kind of righteousness for all of us to witness. That would be amazing. Jesus continues on. We're almost there here, folks, through our extensions. He says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even the pagans do that. The situation here that Jesus is really getting at is having enemies. And the command that he brings out is out of Leviticus 19 that is, love your neighbor. And Jesus' extension here, it really points out that that Old Testament commandment began moving people to, to actually define the line between us and them. Loving those on the inside, okay, they're one of us, and then dismissing or hating or where that really goes with contempt is dehumanizing all those on the outside. And so here Jesus now flips the cultural expectation, commanding his followers to not just love their neighbors, but to love their enemies and even pray for those who persecute them. And in this, participate in reflecting the love of God who shows kindness to all, even to those who might be antagonistic or we would even consider adversaries of God's. Loving our enemies, quite frankly, is one of the hardest extensions that Jesus presents. And he's calling us to some level of a divine love that seeks the good of others, even when they have been nothing but nasty to us. He says everybody loves their friends. There's nothing special about that. I mean, I tend to think friendship is is good, okay? Because that sounds a little harsh. But it's true. There's just nothing special about that. It comes natural. I've talked about with Charlie. Charlie's one of the easiest guys to just love and care for, right? Because Charlie is loving and caring back. But Jesus is pointing to that only a God-filled person loves their enemies also. The hard truth about this is if we want to follow in this way, if we want to be committed Christ followers, we want to be loving people, often that means that we have to make ourselves act on that intention even before we may actually Feel it. That's hard work. Jesus then closes our section of teaching for today with this line. He says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now the context here, because we just talked about loving your enemies, the context is love. It's true, godly love. Love. You see, Jesus here is not talking about moral perfection as some of maybe our old holiness type churches taught us. I, I grew up in that. It was the do and the don't list. Okay, has everybody got that's how you'd be perfect? If you could just maintain the list, you'd be perfect. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. And I'm not throwing shade at all of my wonderful 
previous colleagues and all these wonderful men and women that, uh, that taught me up, I think, pretty well. But that's not what he's getting at. He's actually talking about trusting him. He's talking about being formed by Jesus so that in this level of engagement, of following after him, it's participating in kingdom of God living that then through that step by step, as our video said, day by day, we can actually be perfected through God's love. So this is a lot of heavy teaching that I did not want to break up. So thanks for hanging in there through here. We're getting, we're getting there. We're almost done today. But the question that this, this sits with us and it, and it pushes us is that what does Jesus then intend for us to do or to be according to these transformational extensions that he presents? And here's your, your first little bit of actionable step that we'll, we'll break down just a little bit. But, but he wants radical renovation. The obvious problem that we all are kind of maybe pondering here in the back of our heads a little bit is that this is all so hard to do. Maybe a little head nod. Maybe you guys are perfect at not being angry. I imagine that's true, right? No one has anyone they'd call an enemy of any kind. No, it's hard. It's hard. And that's why we know, right, in this room, we know this is why we need Jesus, not just one time at the altar. That's a good start. But we need Jesus. We need that spirit that we've talked about in previous months. We need that to fill us up. For those of us who do have ears to hear and eyes to see, Jesus is offering us the path towards the best life all rooted in God's kingdom. It's not one that just stops at the outward behavior modifications or rules-based living, but it's one about becoming good people who actually embody, live it out daily, an inside-out righteousness. See, Jesus is calling us to the highest of standards. That's why it feels so difficult. It's inward transformation that aligns us with the heart of God. And we must have the transformative power of the Holy Spirit working in us. And then also, folks, our role is to have the nerve, maybe you want to have the guts to take a real faith dare and live this thing. So, breaking this down, radical renovation, just a couple things. You know, how can we be better positioned for this renovation as we dare to follow Jesus' way? And the first thing is, a couple suggestions that get us there. Active reconciliation. That sounds nice. This is terrifying, right? Whenever conflict conflict arises, you actually take the initiative to seek peace. Whew. It's okay if you shake your head at me. No one likes this. I thought about this all week, people. I'm like, man. Because then, then things start popping to mind, right? And you're like, oh, do I have to present this on Sunday and talk about this? But this is the deal. We don't wait for the other person to come to us. Don't wait for the other person to come to you. If there is tension, if there's unresolved conflict with someone, make it a priority to reach out to them with the goal of reconciliation. Again, reconciliation takes two parties, so that may not happen if they're really resistant. But reach out with the goal of reconciliation, even if it's super uncomfortable. You with me? Did I make you uncomfortable? You're welcome. Next one, excessive generosity. It's this. It's what Jesus is getting at. Be willing to go above and beyond in showing kindness, even when it's inconvenient. If someone asks for your help, offer them more than they expect. If someone asks to borrow money or time, consider not only meeting the need, but exceeding it. Cultivate a spirit of sacrificial serving and giving. That one's hard. These are all going to be hard, by the way. Next one. Replace anger with a pause. When you feel anger or resentment towards someone building up, work on taking some deep breaths and a pause. Then the next step is pray for them. Pausing is a great first step. The second piece, praying for their good, for their well-being, 
for God to bless them. That's what Jesus is getting at. Maybe a, a good idea is to create a list of people that you are currently struggling with, okay? Hopefully that doesn't take you all day, <laughs> but maybe it will. But the people you're struggling with, whether it, maybe it's on a, a big global scale, I can think of two particular people that will go unnamed in this space that probably cause a little bit of tension in your life one way or the other. And if you don't catch on to what I'm talking about, better for you. But it could be people that are deeply, personally connected to you. But spend time praying for them by name, asking God to soften your heart toward them. Okay? Help them, helping you to see them through the eyes of Jesus. Through the love of God that says the rain and the sun both fall and shine on the good and the bad, the righteous and the wicked, God loves even adversaries. And then the last one is accountability and community. Surround yourself with trusted friends or a community who will hold you accountable to living with integrity. Join in as much as you can, as often as you can, with things like small groups, people meeting together with reliable friends where you can openly share struggles and receive encouragement. I mean, this could include being honest with one another about the temptations that we've kind of joked about, but they're very real with anger, with wanting to retaliate. Could be any of the other ones here that we've listed. My last encouragement here this morning, thanks for hanging in there, is this. The way of the kingdom of God is not transactional. It is not put in your seat time, put in your $5, and then get it all back from God. That's not how this works. And if you've been trained up in that, I've kind of picked up some of that along the way. We have to change our mind. Because what Jesus is offering is not transactional, it's transformational. And Jesus would remind us that, that as he does throughout the main text here today, is that he's not interested in people that simply appear good or say good things, or even do some good stuff now and then. What Jesus wants is people who are good because they are fully His. We're either all in, or we're really out. There's no halfway Christians. You see, the good life comes to those who will be intentional about pursuing inside-out transformation. I'll remind you that if you find this jarring, uncomfortable, irritating, I'd love to have a conversation with you, but we'll both take that up with Jesus, won't we? These are hard words. This is not easy. But I like that Jesus makes it pretty clear, doesn't he? Sometimes we don't feel that way. There's a way to live that embodies the kingdom of God. That's our marching orders. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are uh, grateful. I, I say this each time we gather together, but, but these words that have been written down, thank you for inspiring those. Thank you for Matthew giving us this particular account. How important it is, is it, it speaks to us.